Hello, I'm Wendell Wallach. I'm a Carnegie Uahiru Fellow and the co-director of the Carnegie Council's new project on artificial intelligence and equality. Through this initiative, we will be exploring the many ways in which artificial intelligence might be used to ameliorate existing forms of inequality, or perhaps may even exacerbate structural inequalities and create new forms of inequity. This is the second in our online series of discussions. In the first, we talked with James Monika, who's the director of the McKinsey Global Institute. And he told us about McKinsey reports on the future of work in the US and in Europe and the future of the social contract. It was kind of a mixed story in that uh, he was pointing out how actually artificial intelligence may create more jobs than, than it, than it uh, decimates, but those jobs will largely be ones that require a high degree of expertise or they will be very low in the service, in the ranking of the service area. In other words, artificial intelligence could, could actually hollow out middle level jobs. Today, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Christina Kohlkloth. I've known Christina for many years. We encounter each other at international forums hosted by the UN, the OECD, and many other organizations. She has been a tireless advocate for workers' rights and for helping all of us fully appreciate and understand the ways in which digital technologies are are going to affect workers. She's regarded as a thought leader on the future of workers and on the politics of digital technologies. She advocates for the workers' voice. She runs the Why Not Lab and its extensive global labor movement experience. And she has led the UNI Global Union's Future of Work Policies, Advocacies and Strategies for a number of years. Christina was the author of the Union Movement's First Principles on Human Data Rights and the Ethics of AI. So thank you ever so much for joining us today, Christina. Let me turn the webcast over to you. Thank you, Wendell. And, and there's always a pleasure to, to share, uh, in this case, a screen with you. Um, we've had numerous, as you said, opportunities to have a talk uh, on and off stage. So, um, and hi everybody, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about, from the workers' perspective, what are some of the challenges, the negativities we are experiencing right now, and what could be some of the solutions. Now, when Wendell was saying the worker, now I can't see you all, but I was wondering how many of you are actually thinking of the worker as somebody different from you that the worker maybe is the street cleaner or the worker is the person, the frontline worker in the retail shop. Well, the fact is that we, the many of us, the majority of us are wage earners. We are workers, yet we've come to believe we're something different than that. So when I'm talking, really try and think about yourself, your peers, your colleagues, not just the worker who are the ones who are doing the jobs that we are, secretly thankful that we don't have to do. So really sort of understand this narrative of the worker is not just the blue collar work, it's all the way up to, to the academic, to the professionals, as I assume many of you are. So there's lots of challenges facing the world of work or facing us in societies right now. There's the devastating climate change. We have demographic changes, the growing elderly population, where we very soon, with the lack of nurses, the lack of care workers, predicted 21 million worldwide lack of care workers, you know, we have to ask ourselves what's going to happen to especially female labor market participation. We have the ge geopolitical issues that we all know too well right now, which are really disrupting the world, or movement of a power from the West to the East. We have, of course, this pandemic and the devastating effects it has on the here and now, on our friends and our families, but also, of course, on the long term, medium, long term, on our jobs and our societies. 
And then we have technological change. And this digital change, the AI and the digital economy is really just one of these numerous forces which are infringing upon us as workers. So, you know, let me remain for a while in this negative narrative and spend some moments with you here to focusing on sort of the real, the experienced and the devastating facts surrounding the world of work. Now, I really wish to highlight some of the assumptions, the narratives, but then also question them. Now, I can hear some of you think, oh, Luddite, she doesn't like technology. Well, that's far from the truth. I am actually a technological optimist, but I'm at the same time very, very critical of the current trajectory we are on. And then I really want to urge all of you as I'm speaking to think, does it really have to be like this? Could it be different? So in more or less hand and order, let me get going on some of these uh, negativities and some of these striking contradictions that we are experiencing in the world of work. Now, firstly, this rising individualization and precariousness of work across the world. More and more people are left on zero hour contracts or in the gig economy or short term contracts, very fluid rights but also they're left with, uh, you know, to bear the brunt of the market, so to speak. They are the ones who have to shoulder the, uh, the fluctuations in supply and demand or the demand for their labor. Yet we are experiencing that they have no rights. They are stripped of many workers, are stripped of any social and fundamental rights. So they are left in an enormous income insecurity, not knowing whether they can pay their bills from month months. We also, this, this mismatch between the social systems and the current labour market is all too evident, for example, in the yes vote to Prop 22 in California. You know, this third category of worker that is now being introduced, it has been in place in the UK for many, many years. It hasn't worked there and it certainly won't work in the United States either. Now, work is work. My assumption is that no matter how that work is conducted, under what contractual or non-contractual form, all workers should enjoy the same social and fundamental rights. But then again, as I said, who is this worker? Who are the workers? Now, even in a room full of workers, and I ask the floor, who in this room is a worker? I seldom get more than 70% of the hands up. So this is one of the tricks that we've been dealt is to believe that we are something different than a worker. And this is probably a big explanation to the decline in trade unionism. Why should I go together and collectivize with others when you know, I've been told I'm something special and something more? Well, the fact is we are seldom stronger than the weakest link. And this whole perception of us being different from a worker, I think, has a lot to play, but also has the, the highly unacceptable union busting. Employers are spending millions every single year on busting unions. Now, for me, this should be forbidden. Any indirect or direct union busting has no place in our modern societies. So if we look at the futures of work, now there's pluralists there deliberately. There will not just be one future of work. There will be futures of work as we experience them differently from wherever we are in the world, according to the jobs that are available, the skills that we have. One of the things the employers seem to agree with the workers on is the necessary re and upskilling that will have to take place. If you look at the rhetoric around the world, they all sort of latch on to the re and upskilling as if the future of work could be solved through that. But they never mention who's going to pay. Now, how are we going to combine this increasing individualization and precariousness of work with this lack of funding for re and upskilling? Can we expect an Uber driver to take two or three weeks with no income to go on a re and upskilling course? No, of course we can't. So when the employers talk about re and upskilling, my answer is, are you going to pay? They also somehow believe that digital technologies are given. 
you know, that the rest of us, you know, we have to react to the technology that is coming, that the technology is somehow superior to us as humans. Now, this technological solutionism, so to speak, is very, very dangerous. We hear it in the talk of, oh, the robots are coming, as if it's a civilization greater than ours who's going to come and control us. Well, again, you know, we are not powerless here. But the rhetoric somehow is dubbing us into a belief that, that we can't really do anything. Yet my claim is that it is precisely these technologies that we should govern and frame. They're not necessarily born evil, but they're not necessarily born good either. And if we want the world that we are seen to be creating in all of these AI principles and ethical AI thoughts, well, then we're going to have to govern these technologies so they serve people and planet. And not just some people, but the majority, if not all people. And then this links into the whole discussion of automation, the job losses, you know, the fears and how Frey and Osborne's study has been you know, grossly sort of uh, misrepresented, to be honest. But 50 percent of all jobs are going to disappear and, you know, we're going to have devastating impacts on the world of work. Well, yes, if we continue down this current trajectory of doing nothing, well, then we very might, well might see, as Wendell was saying, this hollowing out of the middle uh, level jobs, middle income jobs, and the polarization of the workforce. This might very well happen. But again, it's not a given. You know, we could be demanding of companies when they invest in disruptive technologies that they also are obliged to invest in their people, in their re and upskilling, in their career paths. But many companies, and we've seen this during the COVID crisis, are investing heavily in autonomous systems, semi-autonomous systems, in the hunt for productivity and efficiency. Our markets, as they are structured right now, call for this quarterly shotgun capitalism of proof of earnings increasing all the time. But I want to question this and really ask, are we producing ourselves to hell? If we look at our climate, if we look at the devastating impact this overproduction has had, is productivity and efficiency, are they the goals that we should be striving for? Is it time that we move, as many are calling for, beyond GDP as a measure of success? Imagine what our economies, what our policies, what our markets could look like if we committed to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Now, across the world, we are seeing rising inequalities, and we need to address these inequalities inequalities between genders, between identities, between ethnicities, between race. Now, all of the research has shown that unless we really learn to govern the digital technologies, the algorithms, the data sets, the bias and discrimination inherent in these systems are only going to accentuate the inequalities that we already experience. From predictive policing to the calculation of welfare benefit uh, dues, to automated hiring systems. Again and again, we see in the juridical system inequalities and bias being shaped. Now, at the same time, we seem to believe that these systems are efficient. Well, of course, they're not, and many, many scholars, many practitioners are flagging this, but it's a call again for the regulation and the framing of these systems. Autonomous tools, they need governing. In the world of work, I would hate to experience, which I think we already are in many ways, that a worker who's looking for a new job will not see certain jobs online in the job announcements because that person a priori and by an algorithm has been deemed unfit for that job. We must never have an algorithmic tool, an opaque system, which we don't even know exists, determining our life and our career opportunities. The same in the autonomous hiring systems, who gets hired, who gets fired, on what data is, are these tools built? Do they match if an autonomous decision-making system designed in the United States is deployed in Kenya? Is it matched to the Kenyan culture, to the institutions 
of Kenya, I doubt it. So we cannot turn a blind eye to this discrimination that's potentially happening. And many of us who work in this, you know, we look at the social credit system in China and we kind of shudder and go, oh, that's too much. But again, I want to provoke a little bit here and say, don't we already have that in our parts of the world, in the developed world? But it's not run by an authoritarian state, but by numerous private companies known as well as unknown. And before I sort of end my, my rant here on some of the negativities and some of the things we have to be careful of, I really want to stress that no biological social system has functioned on homogeneity. We need diversity. We need to really work together to ensure that our labor markets are diverse and inclusive. Yet at the moment we're segregating we're undervaluing and we're underpaying the work of many of our peers. So with COVID, with this skyrocketing demand of surveillance and monitoring software, with the rising awareness that we are being turned into objects, into numerous data points that are being used to make influences on us, what will your next move be? Is she likely to vote to the left or to the right? Then we also have to understand that contrary to what the ILO decided in 1944, that labor is not a commodity, we are becoming commodified. We are becoming objects that are fed into these systems regardless of who we really are. We must never, never accept that this is the case. Then we will lose our autonomy. We will lose our democracies. And I can really only echo Shazana Subov's call that we urgently must ban markets in human futures. We simply cannot accept that these influences are going to shape our work and our career and our life opportunities. And then a little word of warning here, because as we all talk about this and as we experience this, as we realize that this is happening, we still have to acknowledge that 49% of the world's population still have no access to the internet. We have in this crisis where schools are closed, 463 million children across the world who are now not being schooled because they don't have access to this technology. Now, education technology isn't solving this problem. Now, again, the call for us to avoid this technological solutionism. We need public investment in the digital infrastructures and not what is happening right now across the world, that the private tech industry is filling that void and offering the mobile mask against forever keeping the data that is generated. These power symmetries that are being created across the world are only going to embed themselves totally unless we turn the tides and start the public investment in the global south. So ways forward, where do we go from here? How can we kind of put some easy, relatively easy steps in place here to, for us to take control over these technologies, for us to shape the digital work, digital society, as we best see fit. Now, again, yes, we must ban markets in human futures, absolutely. Until we get there, there's certain more low-hanging fruits that we could do. Now, of all of these AI principles that are being adopted at firm level, at government level, the OECDs being the first and only intergovernmental principles on AI, they're great. But unless we really start putting flesh to the bone, so to speak, and turning principle into practice, then they remain words of good intent. So at work, we need to really start talking about, okay, how do we fulfill and actualize the principle of fairness? Fair for whom? Fair for management? Fair for the workers? The only way we can solve this is by bringing dialogue back into vogue, so to speak. We need to co-govern these algorithmic systems at work. We need to accept that dialogue is actually the way forward. And I think all of us should urge the International Labour Organization to actually put in place a new convention on workers' data rights.
You know, across the world, in many data protection regulations, workers are directly exempt from them. California is one, Thailand is another, Australia is a third. So workers' data rights need to be improved so these inferences become flushed out, blocked, and stopped. On the digital divides, we really must work together to empower our brothers and sisters in the global south. They need to be bridged, these digital divides, responsibly between the rural areas, the urban areas, between the global north, the global south. And we cannot accept in any shape or form that, that the global south is forced to give away an asset they don't even have control over themselves yet, and that is their data. On the automation, on job losses, again, let's get the companies to be obliged to put in place, for lack of a better word, a people plan. When they invest millions of dollars in disruptive technology, they should be obliged to invest in the skills and the competencies of their workers. Now, on skills, yes, as I said before, we need somehow to democratize access to this re upskilling. We cannot have an individualization of work, yet an assumption that every worker can pay his or her own way. But we also, and this is very important, need to start talking about the, the soft competencies that we have. You know, there's lots of systems, AI systems out there right now that are identifying skills gaps, but they never take into consideration whether you are the glue that sticks the organization together, whether you are the one of the workforce who has all the creative ideas. Yet we seldom write on LinkedIn that I am the one who has all my antenna out for the well-being of my peers. But it's probably precisely those competencies which are least automatable and therefore will grow in significance in our labor markets. On union busting, as I said, this has to be made illegal. There's absolutely, we have a freedom of association. We have the right of assembly and these should be respected and any form of union busting and their big dollars should be made illegal. So I could go on about my call for strong and, and inclusive labor markets. We have to realize that if we accept the precariousness of work for others, it very soon will boomerang around to us. And I think we all should be aware of this. Oh, yes, all our workers can work from home now. COVID has proved that that's possible. We must ask, will this lead to the end of the permanent contract? What is preventing companies from outsourcing to the global labor market and chopping up their, their jobs into tasks and putting that out there? How would this lead, um, uh, what effects would this lead to in relation to our wages and working conditions? So I'm really gonna stop there now. I've been going on and on and I can imagine if, if, if uh, all of this is a little bit overloaded. So over to you, Wendell. Well, this this was a truly excellent rant, um, and you 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 left an awful lot of topics on the table for us to dive into much more deeply. But before I pose a few questions to you, I'd just like to state to everybody who has who has joined us today that uh, we will turn to your questions in just about fifteen minutes. So, if you don't mind putting questions that you would have, you would like us to uh, to discuss into the chat box, that would be most helpful. I see, Christina, that you you more or less endorse the this flood of AI principles that we have seen come along, and you have state what what so many have been saying saying that now we have to operationalize them. I guess I just want to ask you, from your perspective, in terms of worker rights, do you more or less see those principles, particularly the more endorsed lists such as those from the OECD or those from the Beijing principles that represent uh, you know, the um, really a, a billion point four of, uh, of humanity, do you, do you feel that those lists are more or less sufficient if we can operationalize them? Or do you feel there's something fundamentally missing in terms of our focus here upon worker rights, uh, the ability to ensure 
that the digital revolution really um, ameliorates inequalities rather than exacerbating them? That, that's a great question, Wendell. And, and I, I'm actually really curious to hear your answer to that. But let me just give a little, little thought about what I think about these. Our governments, let's take the OECD ones, our governments, the OECD governments later endorsed by the G20 and five Latin American countries have, have adopted these principles. And now we have to hold them accountable to them. If they don't put institutions in place, give the mandate to new authorities to be able to actually check at the company level or in society level how these principles are actually being respected, well, then they're almost worthless. Then we're giving away to this sort of soft law from the bottom up, you know, as long as I do a corporate, you know, AI accountability report per year, everything will be fine. A little bit like we saw the CSR reports, which which many company owners have said to me, actually, you know, I've just done for the sake of having to do them. So, you know, I really think, no, I mean, we've taken a big step in actually adopting some of these principles. And now our governments have a huge task and an urgent task in building the infrastructure, the institutions to actually make sure that they are counted uh, to and respected. But what do you think, Wendell? <laughs> well, the, this is, the, this is the, the challenge of posing a difficult question like this. I mean, my concerns are very similar to yours. I, I don't know whether we're actually going to operationalize them, and I'm concerned that what gets operationalized does not necessarily hold the deployers of these technologies' feet to the fire. And if it doesn't do that, then... Um, my real concern is that we are engaged in a period of ethics washing where mm. corporations embrace principles, but they don't really act upon them. And particularly yeah. in regards to the conversation we have right now, we are in this uh, inflection point in human history that um, humanity is being transformed by these technologies but very few people get a voice in deciding how the technologies get deployed, what kinds of major structural changes we're making to our societies. And I am particularly concerned that we have bottom-up voices, that we have, um, we have more participation in those conversations than we have today, but how we get from here to there it, is not so clear to me. Mm -hmm. I also want to say one thing about uh, you. You talked almost pejoratively about soft law. I am a, I am a proponent of soft law because I think the speed of digital transformation undermines our ability to put in place hard law quickly enough, and therefore sometimes soft law is a, at least a good first step. Um, for those who don't know that term, it's really referring to standards, laboratory practices and procedures, um, insurance policies, a whole plethora of mechanisms that um, can be useful, but they very seldom have any enforcement behind them. So I, I take it to mean that when you are talking a bit pejoratively of pejoratively about soft law, it's that concern that without enforcement mechanisms, it's hard to know whether we're going to get any, any effective governance at all. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. <laughs> no, you are. And, I, and, you know, Wendell, one of the things that really spooks me right now is how successful and with their multi-million dollar investment big industry, big tech is in lobbying politics, you know, politi yeah. politicians to not to actually do their job. And, and what, what disturbs me mostly about this is that democracy is at stake here. And I don't think that, you know, I mean, I've read lots of multinational big tech companies and they're doing quite good stuff, at least on the surface, in relation to checking the ethnicity or the ethical dimension of, of the new tools they're developing and so on. But when you then look at who is part of, the, of their internal governance board on this, there's not one single worker on there. And this, this is why, you know, I keep on saying that you know, when we look at the principles of transparency or auditability or fairness, we have to ask transparent to whom, fair for whom. And there's no way that a junior legal compliance officer in the company can answer that question truthfully. 
therefore we need uh, people around the table. And yes, you know, to govern this, to put these practices in place, to put the public institutions in place to actually enforce uh, these principles, this will take time. But then maybe we actually deserve towards ourselves and our peers to hurry up a little bit slowly here. Well, let's say a corporation took you up on that and they said, okay, um, we would like a spokesperson for, uh, for user concerns. And uh, let's say they go beyond that and they say uh, user concerns, worker concerns. How do you propose they go about figuring out who that, who that member of their board could be? I mean, where, where do they turn to for representation? For, mm -hmm. uh, because my experience has been that uh, there's kind of a, a top-down paternalism where we see various voices representing um, workers, um, underserved yeah. communities, women, um, indigenous communities, small nations, but it's largely the same people. <laughs> and, um, and though I, I love some of the people who are in that, in that role, there are others who I feel like are, that are just placeholders. So it, it seems to me we need to create some kind of network where we at least make available those who we think can engage in bottom-up representation, but also will be trustworthy within the constraints, for example, that a board of directorship of a corporation would, would want. Well, absolutely. And, and I really want to support you on, uh, you know, the need to be to open up these conversations to bring in far more voices. I think a lot of the criticism that has been raised around, you know, the white man slash now and again, a woman um, uh, discussing these things uh, is very valid. Now, but in the workplace, if we look at how could we govern some of these technologies that, you know, the monitoring and surveillance of workers, how could we govern them in the workplaces? Well, you know, that's why we have unions. So you have a lot of shop stewards, as it's called in some parts of the world, staff reps in other parts of the world, who, who are there elected to represent the wider group of, of workers or employees. So again, this is another reason why actually to join a union, to actually have that seat at the table and have that representation, which is a democratic representation. So if you're not satisfied with what your staff reps are saying, well, then it's open for discussion, of course. In relation to the wider world, how do we make sure that we are inclusive and diverse? I think this is a job, of course, of all of us. So if we're ever hosting an event, make sure that we are inviting a diverse group of people, but also that we hold our governments and our companies accountable to whatever tool that they are developing. Well, how's about making an impact assessment and not just an impact assessment along narrow lines, but on broader lines. And again, to be able to do that, they will need to engage in dialogue with how could this infect indigenous groups or underserved communities or the global south and so forth. You know, to think that we have all the answers uh, as office people sat in Silicon Valley, uh, I think would be very wrong. Now I'm being a bit harsh here, but, but I hope you understand what I mean. But, but for sure, you know, again, this is about hurrying up slowly um, to get the mechanisms in place and honestly, to break some of the myths that have been created. Well, I mean, I, a couple of years ago, I gave a speech actually invited by one of the big tech companies that never had a unionist inside their doors before. And when I was presented, I could hear somebody in the room going, oh, a union person. And I picked up on that and said, you know, so I, I heard that, uh, but let, you know, let's talk afterwards. And afterwards, he was like, I didn't know the unions had this point of views. I didn't, oh, I didn't. And, and I think a lot of this, conflict, a lot of the antagonism between us is built on myths and built on misunderstandings that we really should sit, you know, sit down and talk about. When I, when I look at the, these governance concerns all the way, you know, from the corporate all the way to the, the national governance, one of my concerns is whether we have actually enough people who understand the issues who can serve those representative roles. Mm. And I don't know, you know, you, I mean, I'm always 
in great admiration of your understanding of these issues, but I wonder as you deal with unions around the world, whether you feel their leadership has an adequate handle on what's taking place that they can give effective expression to, uh, to the concerns that you're perceiving or whether they are taking the kinds of initiatives with you and others from, for example, the ILO, the International Labor Union, for those who don't know that acronym, um, who do understand what's taking place to, to educate themselves, to educate their members, to um, really upskill in what um, my co-director of this project, Ani Kaspersen, calls digital hygiene which I think she thinks of as going more beyond this political voice, but even just ensuring that everyone in the world community understand what they are subjecting themselves to when they enter into the digital workplace or even the, 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 uh, the even social communications through digital means. Well, listen, we have all been kept in the dark on this, right? The public awareness building around, you know, the digital economy, this data extraction, it has really only started, you know, within yeah. the last year, and they're not profoundly so. Okay, Cambridge Analytica Facebook scandal, that got people a little bit on their toes, but everybody listening to this above the age of, I would say, 40, you know, we sleepwalked into this situation. We never truthfully ask, you know, why is Facebook for free or why is Google Translate for free or this internet? Ooh, you know, we, we kind of you know, got sort of seduced by the magic of it all and, and forgot to, to consider that there's really nothing called a free lunch. Um, so, no, I mean, going back to the unions, this is a very, the, you know, this whole the interconnections of the link between the, the, the infrastructure, the digital infrastructure, data inferences, workers' data rights, artificial intelligence, algorithmic systems, all of that, it's very, very complex. And with the lack of public awareness raising and building, and, you know, that, that um, sort of, I would say, the, the ignorance, and not, not um, negatively said, but around the existence of these systems and also the potentials of digital technologies, you know, I mean, I was recently at an event with a group of technologists who were telling me what they're working on. I was like, is that possible? Is that possible? You know, we can't even imagine what some of these technologies can do. And when you then are a lay union person or union leader and you've never met these technology people, then, of course, it's very difficult to build a critical voice. But we are more and more people and more and more unions who are waking up to this. But then facing, of course, the enormous challenge of what now? How do we become more digitally savvy? What responsible tools are there we can use which are not just further data extraction tools? How can we you know, push back and create a new digital ethos which is probably more responsible and has uh, ethics uh, of a different standard? And that's gonna take enormous time and, and I wish there was, you know, there was more public awareness to this and more funding towards work like this. Otherwise, these power symmetries are just going to continue to grow. I'm wondering what, you know, you gave one anecdotal example, but I'm wondering more broadly, you, you tend to be one of the more tech savvy people speaking for a massive portion of humanity. And do you find that the corporations or even the AI researchers, do they listen to you or do they tend toward dismissing your perspective because they don't feel you have the expertise that they're, they believe are necessary to make informed, give mm. informed advice? No, I, hmm. <laughs> yeah, I feel that everybody pushes me aside though. Um, no, I, I think if people disregard what I say, it's because I've, I've touched a sore spot. Yeah. It's because this whole recognition of me as a worker, our own vulnerability in relation to these digital tools, 
you know, it's, it's hard to admit that it's not just everybody else, it could also be me. Um, so, but that said, you know, in, in the political circles that I, in the OECD, in the United Nations, and in the Global Partnership on AI, and all these other places, you know, when you raise your hand as your workers, you know, people go, oh, her again, you know, <laughs> or, or they've just, you know, got to know me as this devil's advocate, and, but I'm not sure how much I say actually shifts something inside them, which is, which is a shame, you know, we, as you said, we don't need another circus, we actually need to open our minds. So my colleague Alex Wood, Woodson has been uh, monitoring the chat, and Alex, perhaps you can take over and um, tell us what kinds of questions have come that uh, that Christina should respond to. Definitely, thanks, Wendell. So the first question is from Adia Abiodon. How can AI be utilized in a country with a low level of technological advancement? Uh, well, let me turn that into a question. Should AI be adopted in a country like that? You know, we again, what is AI? This is another one of the big mistakes that we do. We call everything that's technology AI at the minute, and, and which is, you know, not really true. I think what the developing uh, economies could really leapfrog over some of the many mistakes that we've made in our parts of the world and start by saying, okay, technology is coming, Facebook, Google, the rest of them are offering to build a mobile mask so more of our citizens can, can have access to the internet. But then already start asking there, do we have the institutions in place to govern this? Do we know what demands we, we should be putting in relation to the data control, data access, and so forth? So again, I think it would be fantastic if we were open towards one another and actually discuss, well, how can you utilize that a lot of people before you, a lot of countries before you, have made horrible mistakes? And what demands could, could you actually put on the table to ensure that your digital industrialization or digital transformation serves your people, your businesses, uh, your society? Okay, thanks. Uh, Alex, before you get to the next question, sure. let's also prompt those uh, who have not put in questions. We, we may still have time for your questions, so do add it to the chat. Definitely. So this next question is from Lorenzo Bellinguer. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing the, the name. Um, how can explainability be made a basic principle before an algorithm is put to use? So explainability on what dimension? The explainability of the outcome of the algorithm, of the instructions to the algorithm, of the data sets around, you know, that, that have been used to train the algorithm and so on and so forth. I think one of the things that I'm working on now, which is, you know, I'm still refining uh, as we go along, but that is, if you imagine a new digital tool is being developed, we should require the developer that, that him or her or they do a, an impact assessment, which includes human rights, which includes workers' rights, societal things, which includes uh, what the data has been trained, what data sets it has been trained on, what the instructions are, the order of the instructions and so forth. And that, that log, if you imagine it as a log, follows the tool. So if I'm a company in Germany and I buy this tool, I receive that log, which will then help me do my own governance. So when I use this tool uh, and I can check for intended, unintended outcomes and so forth, that I can say, well, actually, let's say it's an automated hiring tool that, you know, the, the way that this tool has been designed to identify the ideal engineer in this company doesn't really fit in a German context. How can I adjust the algorithm or the instructions to make uh, this more explainable and more transparent and adjustable? So that's a possible way forward, but I think that it's a very long discussion, explainability on what level. Hello. Wendell, do you have, yeah, I'd like to hear your... Yeah. Let me add a little bit to that because this is a this is something I've talked about quite a bit over the years. Um, it may be that for a lot of algorithms we're talking about deploying, explainability isn't that important. 
So if you're looking at a massive amount of data and you're going to look at the output to make decisions about what kinds of research experiments to put in place, you don't necessarily need any kind of explainability, though the researcher should be sensitive to whether there might be, for example, biases in the input data and factor that into their judgment about how seriously to, to, to take the output that is being put forward. So that's one level, but at the other extreme, we had mission critical applications. Um, and there, and in that circumstance, we need to be actually rejecting the deployment of mission critical algorithms, unless somebody is willing to take responsibility for what could go wrong should those algorithms yeah. fail. At the very least, we should have the forensic capability to look back after the fact and see what was what went wrong so that doesn't occur again. So that might be practical for a self-driving car, but that's not practical when you're talking about an algorithm that might actually launch a, um, a munition. That's, that's just not acceptable at all. So the problem is we have this very different levels or different kinds of deployments and they have different demands upon what kind of explainability should be there or what kinds of testing regimes and certification regimes need to be put in place before the algorithms get, get deployed. And we really have not done the work of even setting up the discrimination for those categories, let alone mm -hmm. put in place mechanisms to ensure that takes place. Uh, well, no, can I add to that? Because yes, on mission critical, I totally, totally get you there. But for example, uh, an autonomous system deployed in a workplace has to, at any and all times, management has to be the responsible actor there. Sure. They're putting this in place, they, and it might have discriminative bias or whatever unintended effects, intended, unintended. But at the moment, and this has really spooked me, before lockdown, I was on my usual, um, you know, giving lots of speeches and also to lots of employers. And I asked them, do you have governance mechanisms in place? Do you know how to unpack the algorithm? And they all said no. Yeah. And what are they essentially saying there is that they are giving away a power to a thing to a proprietary piece of software coming in from the outside and that is, is actually dictating because they let it dictate what happens inside their company. Now, this is very, very dangerous. So some of us have recommended, Christina, that uh, the corporations need to put in place AI ethics officers and review boards to actually catch this kind of thing and to mm -hmm. really to deal with it on every level from from the engineers who build the algorithms to uh, being able to report to the, uh, to the board of directors if something is being deployed that actually could, could put the corporation in a liability situation. So do you support that? And uh, if so, do, is there, do you have some proviso or anything that you think those ethics boards or ethics officers should be doing to protect worker rights on the job? Well, number one, those boards, you know, the workers have to have a seat at the table, right? I mean, that's really important. Number two is, you know, I think we have to look at the education of our engineers and our computer programmers and all of those developing these these tools. I mean, my former stepson, well, he's still in heart, my stepson, he's now graduating as a computer scientist um, from university, and he's had two months of uh, the methodology of science. You know, he hasn't had any teaching on ethical or human rights uh, concerns. So, you know, we need some templates. I think we need some model cards around what questions should we be asking? How do we find responses if we don't understand the systems and so on? But there's a lot of training that needs to be in place for ethical review boards to even have um, a genuine role in all of this. So Alex. Yeah, uh, thank you. So a couple more questions I think we can get to. This one is from Srikanth Muku. Um, Thanks for laying out the workers' futures landscape brilliantly. My question is, in the global south, getting work or employed itself is one of the biggest challenges. 
With low education and skill levels, high unemployment rates compel huge populations not to fight for rights and seek social protections. How do we deal with these challenges at the policy level from both national and global standpoints? Yeah, well, that's another uh, excellent question, which is, which also goes a little bit beyond the, the topic here. But of course, the, the degree of informality or informal work in the global south is just so unacceptable. Some countries, up to 98% of all workers uh, are in the informal economy. They have, in principle, the rights, but they have no means to claim those rights. And again, you know, let, let's look at it. You know, our throwaway economies uh, in this complex supply chains, you know, maybe there should even be a label inside everything we buy that says what, what has been the supply chain of, of this, you know, this piece of clothing. What rights have you know, the workers had or something along those lines, because we so easily can turn our blind eye to the conditions of certain workers that enable our goods to be sold so cheaply in the global north. Now, there are you know, lots of mechanisms between business and human rights and, and that are being put in place here. But of course, I think we have to start with ourselves on that issue. But on, on the informality of work, yes, um, this needs to be a global pressure. I think we have to understand in the global north that the exploitation of, of workers and their working conditions in the global south uh, comes at a price that is too high to justify our $5 jeans. Okay, we'll go to this question from Carnegie Council's Grady Jacobson in Somerville, Massachusetts. How can we set up more concrete metrics for the accountability of private sector companies and corporations to guard against ethics washing and surface level changes that fail to ameliorate the effects of AI on workers' rights? Are there any examples of accountability structures that have worked or are working? Grady, that, that's great. So you can say the collective agreement is an accountability mechanism, right? That we have in many countries, especially in Europe, the, code, the right of co-determination. So workers sit on company boards, there has to be uh, bodies for dialogue uh, and, and, and consultation and information and so on. So, you know, as long as we accept that this power symmetry can be as big as it is, as long as we accept that in, in the US, it's so difficult to form a union. You need 50 plus 1% to form a union, yet we have all these union busting going on. Well, then we're not going to create the best, most autonomous accountability system possible. And that is an agreement, a collective agreement between workers and, and the employers. Now, on a more macro scale, on, on, the, on the sort of a national or nation state scale, are there accountability measures? Well, partly in the GDPR in Europe, where you know, the national data authorities have a much greater mandate than they had before. Here, a worker or union can file a suspicion to the national data authority. They are then obliged to investigate whether there has been a breach of the data protection regulation or not, and vice versa, of course. Anybody can file a complaint or a suspicion. So that's one way of holding companies accountable, organizations accountable to the laws of the GDPR. But no, on workers' data rights, as I said before, they are very weak across the world. And this, is, I think, is no coincidence, subject of heavy industry lobbying in the CCPA. The amendment to exempt workers uh, was partially accepted until 2021. You know, why? You know, of course, uh, that has, you know, we can all speculate on why workers seem to be in such a, a weak position. But this has to be remedied and, and uh, far more accountability measures put in place. And, and one of the things in continuation of our discussion before that the National Data Authority could have an expanded mandate to see these logs, these governance logs of algorithmic systems that both developers and deployers of these technologies actually you know, should be writing and should use. For, for those of our listeners who don't know what the general data protection um, regulations are, they were passed by the EU. They're, they're very high standards in terms of what rights users have in regards to how their data is, is applied. And, and actually it even gives a right to withdraw from uh, 
from participating in in these data in this data collection. The the difficulty is um, how strictly this will actually be implemented by by more rigorous law or upheld by the courts. But this very high standard has actually been adopted by the state of California and does sort of function as a de facto guideline. Every time you have to you give a website permission to collect your data, they're asking for those permissions now. That's all because of GDPR. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. That's okay. This is from Bev Hall. In the supply chain context, we are seeing distinct shifts to tech solutions. How would the power imbalance be challenged through a value chain, which may extend over many borders slash countries? Well, again, you know, we have the United Nations guiding principles, you know, the United Nations guiding principles of business and human rights. It would be an excellent place to start there. Um, I think uh, the more cooperation we can have amongst our nations, amongst experts across our nations, raising the issues that we should be aware of. So there can be built a pushback or a list of demands from um, countries down through the value chain. I think, of course, we have to be very careful right now because COVID discussions are leading many industries to say they're going to break their, their value chain uh, and supply chain and automate more and, and, and lower the risks. And so there'll be even more need for us to cooperate there. But the tech solutionism, I think, in this global north, global south developed developing world conversation has a lot to do with digital colonialism. And this is something that we really have to avoid, that these norms and values embedded in the systems built mainly in the United States and China are not diffused through the world, through very opaque processes and lack of transparency. And then as, as such actually act as a form of colonialism. And this, I think we have to be very aware of. But cooperation, flagging things, leapfrogging some of the mistakes that we made uh, in, in the global north, I think would be a very strong way to, to push back on some of this colonialism that's taking place. What about what's happening in the digital trade negotiations at the World Trade Organization? Oof. Is that helpful or unhelpful? Very, very unhelpful. Now, I would love to be able to see all of you on this call and ask, have you ever heard of the e-commerce discussions happening on the fringes of the WTO? Not many have. But essentially, let me just give you five points of what will happen if these ever get adopted as new digital trade have rules. One minute for your five points. Okay, I, I won't give the five points. But what they literally will do is lock the global south into a very path-dependent trajectory where uh, data has to be flown freely out of their countries, multinationals, no legal presence or physical presence in your countries, and this will be extremely exploitative. So please do have a look at those negotiations. I, I probably should not have uh, brought up such, <laughs> such a deep question as, as we're finishing up, but I think it's, uh, it's only by way of, of wetting everyone's whistle uh, in terms of the breadth and depth of concerns that, that come up within the topics we have been touching upon today yeah. when, we're, when we're looking at, uh, at worker rights within the, the digital economy. Again, first of all, let me just thank you, Christina. This is, uh, I, I think everyone listening in will agree that this has been tremendously informative and clearly touched upon topics that I had not fully considered. And I'm sure that's true for, for all of our listeners. This is, as I mentioned, the second in our series. There will be a podcast that, uh, that Anya Kaspersen will be talking about, Doreen Bogdan from the um, ITU, um, the International Telecommunications Union, and they'll be talking about the history of digital access. And of course, that's such a big 
issue right now when we have, for example, 450 million school children who have no digital access at all, and therefore no access to education during, during this COVID crisis. And then in December, we will have another, um, we'll have another webcast with Annie Cass Pearson and myself, where you'll get to meet her, but also we'll discuss a little bit more in depth about what we perceive to be the issues within this project and, and some of the roads we hope to go down. In addition, we are likely to have some podcasts presenting some of the topics that were to be presented and that was to come up at the International Congress for the Governance of Artificial Intelligence, which has, has been tabled because of the COVID crisis. So again, thank you ever so much, Christina, and thanks to all the crew at the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs that have, that have made this possible. For any of you who would like to to tune in or make your colleagues aware of this podcast. We have just put up our website at www.carnegieaie.org. So that will give you access to our podcast, to transcripts of the, of the podcast and to other information and data about the projects. The, this website has just gone online today and we hope to populate it with more and more information. So again, thank you for tuning in and thank you, Christina. Thank you, Wendell.